Please take your seats so we can get started. Welcome, everyone. I'm Sarah Song. I'm professor of law and political science at the University of California at Berkeley. It is a pleasure and an honor to introduce Roger Smith, the 114th president of the American Political Science Association. He is the Christopher H. Brown Distinguished Professor of Political Science at the University of Pennsylvania. Rogers' research centers on constitutional law, American political thought, and modern legal and political theory, with special interests in questions of race, citizenship, gender, and ethnicity. Throughout his work, Rogers has shown that ideas matter in politics. Material interests are a key driver of politics, but ideas shape how we understand our interests and how we conceive of our identities. We cannot understand political development without examining how ideas shape our social and political reality. I want to highlight just two of Rogers' many contributions to scholarship. The first is his book, Civic Ideals, a magisterial history of American citizenship law from the colonial era to the progressive era. The book shows how American citizenship has been shaped not by any one single dominant tradition, but multiple conflicting traditions. Liberal and civic Republican ideals have competed with ascriptive doctrines of white supremacy, Protestant supremacy, and patriarchy in an ongoing struggle to define what it means to be an American. The book documents how many were legally denied access to full citizenship rights on account of their race, ethnicity, or gender, and how conflicts over these exclusions have driven American political development. The second scholarly contribution is Rogers' more, more recent work on the politics of peoplehood. As political scientists, all of us are interested in how political communities are constructed, maintained, and mobilized. Stories, what Rogers calls stories of peoplehood in a book by that name, play an important role here. He argues no nations are purely civic. All are constituted partly by stories that seek to define elements intrinsic to their members' identities and senses of worth. These include narratives that promise economic or political power and stories that define politi political allegiances in religious, racial, and ethnic terms. While such stories can support valuable forms of political life, they also pose dangers that must be understood if they are to be confronted. In his most recent book, Political Peoplehood, he shows how modern America's growing embrace of multiple overlapping identities in a rapidly diversifying society is in tension with the providentialism, exceptionalism, and racism that continue to hold sway over many Americans. The particular challenge for our time is how, in Rogers' words, quote, to create and sustain flexible forms of moderate peoplehood that renounce claims to unlimited sovereignty and strive to recognize and accommodate as many of the multiple memberships persons have as proves politically feasible, close quote. Rogers has not only written about constructing communities, he has actively been building them. In 21 years of teaching at Yale, he mentored many students interested in politics and history, public law, political theory, and the politics of race and gender. He has been at the University of Pennsylvania for almost as long, mentoring students while serving as department chair, associate dean, and the director of a center. He also co-founded the Teachers Institute of Philadelphia, a university public schools partnership program. Rogers is an incredibly dedicated teacher and mentor. He's won teaching awards at both Yale and Penn and for both undergraduate and graduate teaching and mentoring. Here are some numbers for you. He's chaired 41 PhD dissertations and served as committee member on another 76 dissertation committees. His former students have won best dissertation prizes, including in public law and from the race, ethnicity, and politics section and the women and politics section. And that's not counting his mentorship of countless others who've reached out to ask him to read their work. You know who you are. <laughs> I don't know where he finds the time. I think all the Diet Cokes I saw him drink in graduate school <laughs> must have helped. But on a more personal note, I want to share a story of my own about Rogers. I went to graduate school to study political theory. 
I almost dropped out in my first year because the first real world, the real world significance of mainstream political science scholarship was not immediately clear to me. And also because I wasn't sure that someone like me, an Asian American immigrant woman and only the second in my immediate family to go to college, could ultimately find a welcoming home in political science. But Rogers, through his teaching and mentorship and the example of his own research, helped me see that political science can be an ecumenical discipline that is strengthened by the use of diverse methods and approaches and also by scholars of diverse backgrounds. Rogers served as director of graduate studies at Yale and was instrumental in recruiting and mentoring a diverse group of graduate students, some of whom I see in the audience. I did not know until I attended my first APSA meeting that the profession was not nearly as diverse. The discipline has made progress, partly through the efforts of Rogers and many others, but there's more work to be done. Rogers, thank you for your incredible mentorship and your dedicated service to the profession. I'm afraid our debt to you will never be repaid, but please accept our applause as a small token of our gratitude. Please join me in welcoming Rogers. Thank you, and thanks so much, Sarah. I've been honored to serve as APSA president this year. I owe thanks to many for this year and all along the way. But I'll single out one who helped most. I am the second of four sons of a wonderful father who wanted all his sons to go into the family business. As teenagers, my older brother Dale and I shared a passion for politics and we both studied political science as undergraduates. Dale was ambivalent about whether to go into our father's business or political science. He knew that I only wanted to do political science. He chose to go into the business where he had a brilliant career despite his ambivalence, and that let me go my own way. So I want to say, paraphrasing Marlon Brando in On the Waterfront, Dale, you was my brother. You were supposed to look out for me. <laughs> and you did. So I've been able to pursue a profoundly satisfying career in political science. I trust most of you share my feeling that we are privileged to do what we do. Nonetheless, it's my duty tonight to tell you that our discipline is now facing major challenges in no small measure because the larger political world is deeply troubled in ways that threaten our work and much more. After sketching these challenges, I'll offer ideas on how we can respond to them by pursuing new partnerships in our research, teaching, and civic engagements. Though we must be a pluralistic discipline, both our enduring goals and the difficulties of the present make it wise for us to knit our research results together more fully to illuminate large political problems. We can also deepen our grasp of current politics through more engagement with those outside academia. We'll then be able to convey still more valuable political knowledge still more effectively to the broader world. Let me first assure you that APSA itself is in excellent condition with healthy finances, a superb staff, modernized governance, and most importantly, greater and more productive inclusiveness in our membership, organizational units, and programs than ever before. However, when we turn to the broader political world, the picture is far gloomier. The most striking feature of global politics now is the rise in many countries of nationalist movements generally claiming to be populist. These movements are often hostile to foreigners and to ethnocultural minorities within their countries. They are often also authoritarian in ways that include suppression of academic freedoms, particularly for those who write, teach, and speak about politics. Earlier this year, Human Rights Watch warned that China is striving to shut down its government's academic critics wherever they speak out, at home or abroad. 
Hungary's Viktor Orban is placing the research institutes of his nation's Academy of Sciences under direct political control. In Turkey, the Erdogan regime has fired, blacklisted, or even imprisoned thousands of professors. In Brazil, Jair Bolsonaro's administration seeks to eliminate many departments in the social sciences and humanities. The list could long continue. Here in the US, we don't face comparable threats to academic freedom, but all is far from well. In recent polls, roughly three quarters of all Republicans say American higher education is going in the wrong direction, largely because they see political expression on campuses as biased against conservative views. President Trump has threatened to deny federal funds to institutions viewed as curbing free speech, especially by silencing conservatives. Many left-leaning academics also face mounting pressures to refrain from provocative statements, not just in classrooms, but on social media. Those pressures come from conservative watchdog groups, higher education donors, and administrators. The recent controversies over political speech on campuses have tempted many institutions to give low priority to programs that feature politics. Political pressures are exerted most readily on public institutions, which teach over 73% of the higher education students in America, while four-year public institutions hand out over 63% of the political science degrees. So it matters greatly when state legislatures, wealthy donors, and parents paying tuition signal that they don't want their schools to feature political science. We also don't benefit from the trend in higher education to meet today's difficulties, including high tuition and student debt, by turning to business executives for leadership experienced in managing for-profit corporations. Like too many modern CEOs, these administrators often focus on generating short-term value for the institution. They do so by favoring disciplines that attract large governmental and corporate grants, such as computer science and some STEM fields, rather than liberal arts fields like political science. They are also often allergic to student and faculty protesters, preferring online student customers and contingently employed teachers. There are counter trends. Dismayed by current politics, some states like Florida are now adding civic literacy mandates for higher education students, extending the requirements to study American governments that other states, including Texas and California, have long had. These policies prompt many institutions to maintain strong political science programs, though they can also heighten efforts to control what political scientists teach. Many colleges and universities are also now trying to show they're providing valuable outreach to their communities, and sometimes political scientists are seen as doing so. Even so, recent years have seen efforts at a number of institutions to close down political science programs or roll them into, in one case, a new academic Department of Homeland Security, another, a graduate public policy program, and another into the history and the criminal justice departments with the political science courses taught mostly by adjuncts. The examples aren't massive in number, but they're real and rising. They may be reinforced by the recent decision of the National Science Foundation to replace its political science program with two programs, one focused on security and preparedness, the other on accountable institutions and behavior. NSF officials hope that funding for political science will now increase, but they're making these changes because they see political science as a toxic brand that harms funding for all the social sciences. Political science will soon be the only social science that doesn't have its name as part of any NSF research program. Curbs on academic freedom and emotions of our discipline are clearly bad for political science, most or all of us would agree that authoritarian regimes hostile to intellectual and political freedoms are bad for humanity. But the forces driving these developments are strong and deeply rooted. They not only include efforts to make academic institutions resemble for-profit corporations, or in many lands to make them subservient to the regime's rulers, Often these forces include popular resentments toward academia, seen as a realm of self-centered elites who are condescending toward and ignorant of the perspectives of many in the publics we claim to serve. With these deeply concerning trends in global governance and attitudes toward higher education and political science, the hard question arises, 
What good can political science do to protect our interests and to contribute to a better path for global politics? How can we best display our value in hostile political climates? And how can we generate more value that helps improve those climates? Answers must come from a sense of where we are as a discipline, what our goals are, what our methods are, what our strengths and limits are, and why we are the way we are. My thoughts arise from four decades in the profession and some study of our history, including past APSA presidential addresses. Several APSA presidents have noted that political science seek to learn about politics in part because we get aesthetic pleasure from doing so. Virtually all have also suggested that we seek to do good in the world by communicating knowledge that can help people better govern their societies. We seek to do so through exploring sources and solutions for political problems and through civic education. Our pursuit of those goals has been profoundly shaped by what remains the major turning point in the history of American political science, the behavioral movement that gained predominance in the 1950s. It shifted the discipline's center of gravity from description and evaluation of governmental institutions informed by political philosophy toward quantitative analyses <clears throat> using data measurements to test modest generalizations about human behavior within and across societies and time periods. In 1958, V.O. Key depicted this shift most clearly while expressing concern about mounting antagonisms between those doing normative political theory and those doing empirical behavioral work. He thought those endeavors needed each other, but he had no formula for staying their divergence. Periodically, subsequent APSA presidents have also worried about the growing fragmentation of our discipline. In the 1960s, great figures like Truman, Allman, and Easton briefly hoped political science could unite around the analysis of groups in relation to the inputs and outputs or structures and functions of systems. Later, both Warren Miller and Eleanor Ostrom contended that political science should unify by pooling most of our methods in collaborative endeavors to address large substantive issues. Other APSA presidents have championed disciplinary pluralism, highlighting our diverse contributions while stressing the costs of only doing conventional behavioral studies. Since the 1960s, a number have warned that quantitative rigor was being given undue priority over focusing on major issues. They suggested this imbalance contributed to the discipline's embarrassing slowness to recognize big developments like the civil rights and protest movements of the 1950s and 60s, the burgeoning of religious conservatism in the 1970s and 80s, and the deepening popular distrust of establishment leaders in the late 20th century that fueled recent populist uprisings. In so arguing, Robert Putnam noted in 2002 that even as the discipline has made overall progress, it has swung between periods of scientism and, act scientism and activism. He contended we must always pursue both. Though Putnam read a younger Roger Smith as dissenting, I've always agreed with the formulation at which he arrived, that more precise is better, but still better an approximate answer to an important question than an exact answer to a trivial question. Putnam worried that the salience of answering big questions had dimmed in the profession over time, but he saw the tide turning toward ardent pursuit of both. In many respects, we are striking a better balance today. Consider one of the greatest issues in modern America, the rise of staggering levels of economic inequality over the past generation. Political scientists like Larry Bartels, Martin Gillens, and Gordon Lafer have used both quantitative and qualitative techniques, mapping outcomes and mechanisms to show that policymakers at the national and state levels give the wealthy the inegalitarian policies they want while ignoring the preferences of most Americans. As a discipline, we're wrestling productively with the implications of this reality for democracy, for populist resentments, and for both economic and environmental policies, among others. Many other contributions could be listed. But today's challenges mean we must focus on how to do still more. We're held back by at least three factors. The first is the sheer intellectual difficulty of our work. Political science is not rocket science. It's harder. 
Human political behavior is shaped by so many variables that it's hard to find regularities with much specificity that hold across much time or space. Gift giving that seems moral and obligatory in one context may be deemed insulting or corrupt in another. And unlike rockets, our subjects' interpretations of our findings can alter their behavior, as in the impact of broken window theories of crime on law enforcement. We always struggle as well with the mystery of how far human political agency is determined by external variables, and insofar as it is not, whether it can be fully explained at all. Faced with these difficulties, we often focus on smaller, more tractable, empirical questions, hoping that we'll accumulate over time a body of reliable findings that may equip us to engage grander topics down the road. But if smaller studies are all we do, if far more than the natural sciences, we postpone seeking to combine these studies to address major problems, we can't be surprised when many who pay our bills complain that we consign everything they most care about to our constant calls for further research. The second factor holding us back is that, as Charles Lindblom said in 1981, it's hard to recognize, much less escape, assumptions in our political thinking that are shaped by the dominant institutions, practices, and norms of our societies, all the more so when powerful forces in those societies act against all questioning of arrangements that benefit them. Both our internal limitations and external political pressures can lead us not to reflect on premises that, if reconsidered, might help us see why the political world doesn't always work in ways suggested by conventional assumptions. So we always need to build assumption questioning into our discipline as much as we can. The third, but more, more mundane, but still crucial factor constraining us is that we pursue our profession within modern market systems that reward many kinds of work, but they reward some kinds more readily than others. Though we political scientists share a profession, we work in departments, programs, and higher education institutions that compete with each other. That competition can spur excellent, but again, in some respects, more than others. To win prestige and attract resources, many institutions want highly ranked departments, and many political scientists want to be in highly ranked departments. Rankings today are primarily based on the quantity and quality of faculty research publications, which administrators, especially CEO-style administrators, sometimes judge through citation counts and through publications and journals that are ranked highly, often because of their citation counts. Scholars are also evaluated by peers and published reviews and confidential letters, and these assessments go well beyond counting exercises. Still, the linkage of rankings to frequently published and widely cited research gives scholars incentives to undertake projects that carve out from large topics sets of narrower questions favored by subfield literatures, questions that can be settled relatively definitively by quantitative methods. These projects have the best chance of generating a series of what some call minimal publishable units, articles that appear in well-ranked places and are cited by others pursuing similar agendas in those venues. Our academic markets don't encourage scholars to seek to integrate their work systematically with those researching different aspects of large topics, especially those using different methods. There's nothing malicious about this. Much of this research makes valuable contributions. It's also easy to overstate the impact of market forces. The roster of recent APSA award winners shows that our discipline rewards scholarship that is richly diverse in methods, substance, and authorship. Even so, our academic markets do create pressures, especially for younger scholars, to do research on narrower, more technical, and more conventional questions which may or may not eventually shed light on larger topics of general interest. And even when our work does illuminate such topics, the writing habits born of efforts to impress journal referees often obstruct communicating our insights to wider audiences. The political scientists at NSF strongly believe that many in our discipline are doing outstanding work. But even in writing grant applications, we too often present our research as seeking to fill gaps in our insular literatures, or we promise only to generate technical advice on tactics 
to party operatives, legislators, or other officials. These endeavors have worth, but we often fail to make clear to broader audiences that we're focused on problems they are experiencing. So what many of us find beautifully rigorous, many outsiders find hopelessly arcane. Our profession is also shaped by the fact that institutions pursuing high rankings, particularly wealthy and prestigious ones, often place only minor emphasis on teaching because it's less visible and because we have few rigorous means to assess effective teaching, especially in its long-run impacts. The renewed support for civic education suggests that even so, many in the public value our teaching more than our research. We alienate supporters when fees go higher and higher for professors who teach less and less. Similarly, many universities define service as work within the institution to support its research and teaching, not direct constructive engagement with the wider world. Such civic engagement may instead be dismissed as dereliction from academic duties. As a result, some contend that our academic markets fail to assign suitable value to publicly useful research and service that don't appear in major disciplinary journals. Some faculty in Europe, where governmental research metrics loom still larger, argue that current metrics not only militate against relevance in political science scholarship, paradoxically in the name of social accountability, the research metrics also discourage giving time to teaching. These aspects of modern academic life can hinder how deeply we engage the major developments of our time, including the rising authoritarian tides, hostile academic freedoms, and they can hamper us as we try to persuade those who doubt our worth. Education soci sociologist Stephen Brent notes that research funding and enrollments in America's universities and colleges are high, but he documents mounting dissatisfactions with academia and he contends that we need to do a better job of connecting with, without becoming subservient to, the external actors whose support we seek. We also need to focus more on improving teaching to enhance student learning, which by some measures is actually declining. Though in political science, initiatives have long been underway to do all these things, the state of our discipline makes progress hard. We are and must be characterized by a pluralism that includes not only divides over methods and subset of interests, but also a great variety of higher education institutions, as well as a wide range of identity groups. It's not clear how we can get it together to partner with each other in facing the challenges of our time. But fools rush in, so here are my ideas. We should begin with the cornerstone value of all academic work, intellectual honesty. It is the life-sustaining heart of all valid methods of inquiry. There simply is no way to pursue real knowledge without being honest, at least with ourselves, about what hypotheses and claims we are seeking to advance, what count as evidence and reasons for and against those claims, and whether we've done all we can to collect and weigh systematically all such evidence and to assess alternative accounts. To be sure, as Arthur Meltzer has shown, scholars of politics have always faced ethical questions about how fully we seek to communicate the results of our inquiries. Scholars may well risk harsh political reprisals against themselves and those with whom they have worked, and they may judge that publicity for their findings will impede achieving desirable political outcomes. Those worries arise even in relatively free modern regimes. Jennifer Hochschild considered abandoning her study of how commitments to democracy threaten court-ordered racial desegregation because she worried about discrediting either democracy or desegregation or both. Robert Putnam debated presenting his Skype Prize lecture because of its evidence that demographic diversity could erode social capital. Peter Singer and others are founding a journal of controversial ideas in which authors can publish under pseudonyms since writers on issues like abortion have received death threats. Yet, while we have concerns over how we communicate our work, I believe that even those who doubt the possibility and desirability of objectivity, as I do, still recognize that to gain insights, we must be as honest as we can with ourselves and our peers about the sources and evidence for and the biases and limitations of our views. The quest to be intellectually honest so that we can truly learn 
may in fact be the only commitment that all political scientists and all in academia share. Even so, we often fail to live up to it. In recent years, starting in social psychology, all the social sciences have had to recognize that many leading studies haven't proven replicable. Some believe the reasons go back to publishing pressures, because editors love statistically significant counterintuitive findings, and because so many judgment calls go into data cleaning, imputation of missing variables, choices of statistical models, significance measures, outcomes to report, and more, even well-intended scholars may present exciting findings that similar studies fail to reach. And cases of deliberate cherry-picking of results, p-hacking, forgery of data, plagiarism, and other abuses do occur in ways that even conscientious colleagues can miss. We can take pride in the fact that our discipline has actively sought to address these problems in recent years. Even before the non-replicability controversies arose, many quantitative political scientists began to face up to long minimized issues of omitted variables and other weaknesses in observational research by pioneering new randomized field experiments. The contributions of this experimental turn are undeniable. Though major debates persist over how far it solves all methodological problems, over its ethical dimensions, and over whether an overemphasis on experiments will unduly constrict the questions we ask. More recently, both quantitative and qualitative researchers have sought to promote rigor and intellectual honesty by encouraging scholars to make data sets available online, by posting research designs with journals before results are reached, by employing more demanding significance tests, and by working collaboratively to conduct similar experiments in different locations, among other steps. These initiatives, too, raise major questions that have been usefully explored in the qualitative transparency deliberations steered by Tim Buta and Alan Jacobs. The issues include whether new publishing requirements will disadvantage some kinds of valuable scholarship, including studies using confidential interviews in authoritarian regimes, research on vulnerable groups in all societies, and ethnographies, where researchers develop concepts inductively from the perspectives of their subjects, Scholars who do such work, who are often themselves members of marginalized groups, may be similarly disadvantaged. As a discipline, we must continue to address these vital issues, recognizing that whatever our methods, we share obligations to do research in ways that are as intellectually honest and rigorous as possible, and as dedicated to forming and answering important questions as possible. And I believe we can do still more to live up to the demands of intellectual honesty in ways that can better equip us to meet today's challenges. We claim our discipline as a whole strives to achieve and communicate findings on important theoretical and political issues, as APSA's strategic plan puts it. But not only have we permitted our pluralism to mean that we rarely synthesize our inquiries into more comprehensive and cohesive accounts of major questions, even though we often suggest that our particular findings by themselves shed light on larger issues, we rarely try to show how and why that is so. Instead, particularly in our journals, we leave our accounts of why and how the topics of our specific studies are broadly important undeveloped, sometimes even unstated. The May 2019 American Political Science Review provides examples of how we shape the presentation of research by outstanding young scholars in ways that cloak the contributions of their work to these larger disciplinary goals. Taylor Carlson's lab experiments indicate that the political news people receive through social networks differs significantly from what traditional news media provide. Adam Zelizer's field experiments with state legislators who share offices with fellow partisans show that these lawmakers take cues from those they see as like-minded policy experts in order to decide what positions to take at certain points in legislative processes rather than being self-reliant throughout. What is the larger significance of these findings? Both articles give more attention to their implications for scholarly debates about political information and cue taking than they do to how the conduct they depict shapes most people's lives. Zelizer briefly worries in conclusion that like-minded cue taking may deepen polarization. Carlson that social communication may have significant biases. But though both do more elsewhere, 
Their APSR pieces stop at these suggestions. They do so not only because of practical limitations, but also because reviewers have told them that their focus should be on the scholarly literature. So they don't lay out why and how cue-taking and social communications may have consequences that should concern many outside of political science. When we do make claims for our fi findings, moreover, we must acknowledge that our results, whatever our methods, always remain probabilistic and corrigible. This is so in part because, as modern epistemologies argue, all specific findings are always embedded, at least implicitly, in larger accounts, big pictures of how politics and the world work, which help us judge why specific findings are not only probably true, but also probably of real empirical and normative significance. Too often, we barely suggest the elements of the big picture accounts that show why our work is important beyond academia. So while our scholarship can often claim to have established particular causal or descriptive findings rigorously, often we can't honestly claim to have elaborated or defended our reasons for regarding them as significant. As a result, many lay readers doubt the importance of our studies and even our desires to do important work. I therefore suggest that we need to find ways to place our particular studies more explicitly in broader accounts of politics that can credibly indicate their significance. When political scientists study different elements of similar big pictures, moreover, we should attempt systematic syntheses of their arguments more often than we now do. Our research results may then either reinforce each other, enhancing our contributions, or they may conflict, raising vital questions. And at times, scholars who embrace the same big picture but who work on different dimensions of it with different methods may find they can actively partner with each other, as Miller and Ostrom urged. The pluralism of our discipline makes it unlikely that we'll converge on any single big picture of politics in the foreseeable future, but I doubt we need to do so. We simply must make more explicit the big pictures with which we are all already tacitly operating. To give an example, but it's just an example of a big picture. A few years ago, I proposed that we try to capture the broader significance of political developments by presenting them as parts of spirals of politics. This proposal was directed to my fellow historical institutionalists, but it isn't confined to them since all political behaviors occur within historical sequences. As shown in this figure, spirals of politics depict the stages through which political developments typically occur. Political phenomena always arise out of pre-existing human and natural contexts. These include arrays of political, economic, and social institutions and practices, human identities, and ideas about how to live, all taking place in physical environments with evolving features. These contexts comprise stage one of any spiral of interest. They may lead many to feel dissatisfied with how and by whom they are being governed, and those feelings often spur fresh political thinking and behavior. The thinking includes people reconsidering what their political interests and identities are as partisans, as social movement activists, as communities facing threats, and more. And so some may decide on new goals and strategies. These emerging ideas, identities, goals, and strategies comprise stage two. Stage three occurs when those with newly mobilized senses of political purpose form coalitions with others with overlapping goals. These coalitions then compete with rival ones. Coalitions clash either in electoral contests, which may be more or less formal, free, and fair, or by a force. Either way, these clashes generally enable one coalition to gain power over most existing governing institutions and or to create new ones in order to implement policies to achieve their purposes. Those institutional and policy innovations constitute stage four. Often the new policies and institutions prove to have unintended consequences, but whether intended or not, the defining feature of stage five is that these changes in governance reshape many of the political, economic, social, and the physical contexts that comprise stage one. The modified contexts of stage five then eventually give rise in stage six to the formation of new ideas, identities, interests, goals, and political actions as the spiral of politics continues following the same basic stages but with altered content. 
The model doesn't assume these alterations are desirable. Political life can spiral down as well as up, and it can just go sideways. Nor is there any guarantee that the victories won in stage three will last. The losers now may be later to win. But the spiral model does accept that any specific change gets much of its significance from its place in larger developmental sequences, even though, as indicated by the thinner lines pointing backwards in figure one, not all changes occur in the main directions shown on a spiral. Still, most political behaviors can be usefully mapped as occurring along such a spiral, and I suspect that most of us imagine whatever political phenomena we study are playing roles in the kinds of developmental paths that spirals depict. We may, however, rely on other kinds of big picture accounts. One strength of the spiral of politics model is that it can be synthesized with other big pictures making more specific claims. These include Marxist analyses privileging class struggles, views depicting politics as driven by individual economic interests, portraits of politics as contests among social groups, histories that trace stages of development to technological or ideological innovations, and more. But scholars may choose to invoke their preferred big picture account without referring to the spiral of politics or any similar model. My argument is not for historical institutionalism. It is simply for making our big pictures more explicit. What would doing so involve? Continuing to use the spiral model, take Carlson's work as an example. If we treat 1990 as stage one, in that year, today's social media didn't exist. But novel internet technologies did, and scientific, economic, and political actors were forming and debating ideas about how to put them to public use, stage two. In 1991, CERN, the governmentally sponsored European Research Consortium, made its worldwide web technology freely available to all. In 1992, the US Congress passed the Scientific and Advanced Technology Act, permitting the NSF's internet to connect with commercial networks. In ensuing years, entrepreneurs used the web, the internet, to create social media companies. They were subject to different regulatory regimes in different areas of the world that sometimes altered the decisions taken by CERN and Congress. These political processes comprised stages three and four. Those developments produced a modern stage five in which contexts of communications are greatly different than in 1990, with persons receiving greatly varied political news through social media in contrast to traditional media, as Carlson shows. Carlson couldn't have documented the stages of this spiral in detail in her article, but a brief sketch might have served three purposes. First, it would help readers understand how politics partly generated the phenomena she studies. Second, it would help other political scientists consider how her findings fit with, challenge, or are challenged by their work on related topics, perhaps transnational organizations or neoliberal regulatory regimes. And third, placing her results in this bigger picture might make it instantly clear to general readers why the new social media are not just intellectually interesting. Their rise presents people with significant political choices about whether to continue the policies that led to current difficulties or choose a different regulatory path. We could undertake a similar historicizing of Zellerser's findings, but he might prefer to invoke a different big picture, perhaps one focused on individual and institutional decision making. Whatever it might be, that account could amplify the relevance of his findings to other scholars and to general readers. Admittedly, my advice poses risks. If a scholar suggests how a paper's findings fit into a more sweeping picture of politics that the author can't document in the article, some reviewers, editors, and readers might find the big picture unpersuasive and reject the paper. Others might be convinced the big picture matters, but not that the reported finding adds to it. Yet while those risks are real, our discipline falls short of our goals when we socialize authors to keep hidden assumptions and contentions that are vital to the broader significance of their work. We're far more likely to strengthen our individual scholarly products, to discern opportunities for productive intellectual partnerships, and to live up to what we profess to be our aims if we feel obliged to bring the broader pictures into which we place our results into view. We'll also be more able to persuade skeptics why and how our studies matter for people's lives. What about V.O. Key's worry that political philosophy, including the history of political ideas and normative analytical and critical political theory, can't easily reside under the same roof as our empirical research? Here, too, recognizing the value of big pictures helps. 
After all, political theorists of all stripes advance big pictures. Most behavioral scholarship presumes the veracity of one big picture or another, whether it's the group pluralism of Bentley, Truman, and Dahl, the economist world of individual rational choices, behavioral social psychology, or left-leaning accounts of class hegemony. Those big pictures are all debatable. Theorists offer rival accounts that can suggest empirical inquiries which might strengthen or weaken the empirical and normative credibility of current behavioral big pictures, as well as others advanced by canonical figures from Plato and Machiavelli to Fanon and Foucault. And within modern political science, theorists like Waltzer, Connolly, Mansbridge, and Fraser have provided pictures of politics that can help us formulate vital questions about the limits of pluralism, the politics of negotiation, the sources of political resentment, and more. Exploring different political theories can especially help us recognize unexamined assumptions that may limit contemporary research, even as that research usefully challenges empirical and normative assumptions in major theories. Political theorists can also help us imagine alternative political communities and institutions that might better respond to current discontents. Consequently, as much or more than key, I believe political theory in all its varieties can contribute to and benefit from the expanded intellectual partnerships we need. I turn now to two other ways to strengthen our research contributions that, unlike this call to develop our big pictures, are not exhortations for all political scientists. They are, however, calls to recognize the importance of some kinds of work that we have unduly minimized. One call is substantive, the other is methodological. The substantive call is to do more research that takes human identities as our dependent variables, as conceptions, categories, memberships, and behavioral performances that are not purely natural or extra-political, but are instead partly constituted by political processes. In the last generation, scholars in many disciplines, including feminist, disability, critical race, and queer theorists, have usefully disrupted many older assumptions about identities. But political science still needs to give these topics more prominence, especially in our empirical work. Though it's now common to hold that many identities are intersectional social constructions, often we still model identities as fixed, politically exogenous, independent variables that affect matters like voting behavior or senses of political efficacy. As Chris Aiken and Larry Bartels have argued, the concept of identity remains imperfectly integrated into the study of political behavior, and in particular, the role of political elites in structuring politically relevant identities and cleavages needs to be understood better. Though I've long made similar arguments, my previous depictions of the spiral of politics failed to highlight how identities, too, are often modified as political spirals proceed. That neglect means my own big picture didn't sufficiently challenge the deeply embedded tendency of our discipline and most human thought to treat identities at any stage one as originating in biological or economic or sociological systems, not politics. So let me stress. I believe every stage one is preceded by spirals of politics that have done much to shape all the identities of everyone we find there. Their identities shouldn't be presumed to be pre-political. Instead, we should always entertain the hypothesis that identities have been partly produced by and can be modified or eradicated by political actions. We may decide that identities are most politically significant in their roles as causal variables, and we may conclude that some identities, perhaps class or partisan ones, are most deeply determinative in our lives. Even so, we shouldn't assume away the possibility that all human identities are politically constructed, and I do mean all. Racial, ethnic, gendered, sexual, economic, religious, linguistic, cultural, national, regional, familial, and more. Politics not only shapes many identities commonly seen as political, such as party ID and nationality, its reach also extends to things that can appear purely social, such as people's names and recreations. Resistance to white domination helps explain why African Americans often choose different spellings for names pronounced similarly to those of whites. Legacies of conquest and imperialism help, help explain why many East Asians play baseball while many South Asians play cricket. 
I believe that more pervasively than we have understood, all people are who they are, partly because politics created policies and institutions that defined and favored some identities while disfavoring and punishing others. This has always been true. Even so, we have focused on studying politics as who gets what, when, and how, in Harold Laswell's phrase, or on who and what has power over whom. Until recently, the study of how and why politics shapes who people feel they are hasn't been one of our discipline's dominant themes. Yet we can't fully understand who gets what or who governs whom if we don't understand who becomes whom. How and why human identities, particularly dominant and subordinate identities, are constructed, sustained, and disputed. There are many reasons for this neglect. Studies of how politics shapes identities can destabilize power structures that scholars may not wish to challenge. Some may resist studying the politics of identities because of their aversions to identity politics. And thinking that all human identities may be partly the products of politics can be demoralizing. We may fear that no identities are authentic and that there is nothing in which we can firmly anchor our choices, our values, and our purposes. Yet our disciplinary history suggests that exploring more deeply the politics of identity formation using all pertinent methods might help us see better why many religious believers, not just fossil fuel industry executives, ignore the science supporting climate change. Why some workers' groups support policies that don't maximize their wealth. Why movements like Black Lives Matter, Me Too, Democratic Socialists, militant Islamic groups, and today's new nationalisms are all stirring modern politics and more. These are things we need to understand. Toward the same end, I suggest we must also make more prominent a certain set of methods, those involved in what we now call civically engaged research. By this, I mean research that is done through respectful partnerships with social groups, organizations, and governmental bodies in ways that shape both our research questions and our investigations of answers. Those last points are vital. Civically engaged research is not simply field work. It does not focus on taking survey instruments and experimental designs constructed with our internal disciplinary debates in view and then going to remote locales to administer them. Our discipline needs such field work, but we also need research in which scholars listen to their partner groups and organizations when deciding what to study, how to study, and what answers are convincing and helpful. Some scholars reject calls for such research as summons to pick up the dewy-eyed mantle of progressive reformers. These critics fear will sacrifice what they call scientific objectivity and what I call intellectual honesty for service to political causes, usually left-leaning ones. But to conduct civically engaged research well, scholars must use appropriate social science methods, and they must not suspend critical judgment toward those with whom they work. Civically engaged research must genuinely aim at achieving deeper understanding of public problems while also helping to solve some of them with the learning coming in part through the helping. But civically engaged research always involves ethical questions about how far researchers should accept and assist the goals of those with whom they work. In the recent Medikita initiative, for example, study teams sought to partner with local NGOs and government offices in six countries when designing, as well as implementing, broadly similar interventions in voter information. They commendably strove to design research that could advance cumulative learning while also addressing the varied concerns of their civic research partners. If, however, such studies were to involve spreading misinformation that aided a partner organization in local political contests, it would represent unethical co-optation, not intellectually honest research. But while there are dangers, we modern political scientists have probably done too little civically engaged research, not too much. The work we have done has also been skewed toward groups with which researchers have strong ideological affinities. Though such rapport can be productive, as a discipline, we must learn from all segments of our societies. If more of us had been attending to the diversity of black organizers in the 1960s, to anxious fundamentalists, 
as well as assertive LGBTQ advocates in the 1970s and to angry farm and factory workers in the early 21st century, we might have perceived sooner many major changes in American politics. And if more of us had actively worked with all these groups to help them address their concerns in ethically defensible ways, then black communities, conservative religious groups, gay activists, and workers and farmers might feel less suspicion and disdain toward academics than many do in the US today. The same may be true in other regions of the world. Intellectual honesty means I can't guarantee that more civically engaged research would have helped in these ways, but I know we didn't do much, and in light of where we are now, it's worth trying to do more. All these arguments form part of the case for many recent APSA initiatives to promote public engagement, professional inclusion, and better teaching. Building on this work, my own task force on new partnerships has initiated new research partnerships on critical issues, beginning with the Congress Reform Project conducted in alliance with two think tanks, Brookings and R Street. The task force has also launched new pedagogical partnerships between research intensive and teaching intensive institutions, and it has established a new APSA Institute on Civically Engaged Research, along with an APSA award honoring civically engaged scholarship. In addition, the task force has sponsored a public scholars program that funds graduate students to translate political science articles into accessible summaries to aid public understanding and teaching. We can't, however, hope, to, hope to strengthen our profession mainly through top-down actions. We must modify how we run our journals, departments, and classrooms. Journal editors and reviewers must always seek to ensure the honesty and rigor of our research, but to fulfill our promise to present important findings, we should discourage writing minimal publishable units and encourage striving for maximally significant units. To do so, publication policies must not disadvantage synthesizing accounts or works that use confidential sources or inductive projects suggesting new possibilities. Even as we improve causal testing, we need it all. Now my last unsettling suggestion. In light of both our goals and current challenges, I believe that when it comes to building our departments, we can't afford to take raising our rankings as our overriding goal. Citational and reputational, right, citation and reputational metrics have real value, but they shouldn't dominate all decisions concerning who we hire and promote, what research we do, and how and how much we teach. As a discipline, we can partner best with each other and contribute most if we embrace departmental pluralism. In many settings, we should create departments with distinct identities by recruiting scholars who work in different subfields with different methods, but whose substantive interests intersect sufficiently that the department can claim it collectively illuminates specific problems. Though university administrators will never cease to take pride in highly ranked departments, they may well be still more favorable to ones that have earned reputations for scholarship and teaching that usefully address a visible subset of the world's major political challenges. We also need our departments to risk supporting civically engaged research in their hiring and promotion decisions to make it more central to the discipline. And most importantly, we need to accept that it's now crucial for us to teach, not necessarily more, but better, in part through valuing colleagues who develop good ways to assess and improve their own teaching and all teaching, just as much as we value colleagues who produce impactful research. We will dissipate the main positive development for our discipline in these difficult times, the new emphasis on civic education if we convey that we don't really regard teaching as important. For in the end, though it's great that we love studying politics, we can't forget that we earn the opportunity to do so only by benefiting those on whom we rely. I find learning about politics endlessly fascinating. And I think Aristotle was right to suggest that politics is architectonic. Political institutions do much to construct the public and private spaces, including the realms of commerce, culture, and consciousness in which people live their lives. So it is vitally important to learn why some political creations endure and, fall, and others fall, why some help their inhabitants to grow and flourish, and others leave people cramped and diminished. We must remember, however, that for most people, 
projects of political understanding and construction are only steps toward creating conditions in which they can pursue many other worthwhile forms of happiness. In this spirit, John Adams once wrote, I must study politics and war, that our sons may have liberty to study mathematics and philosophy. Our sons ought to study mathematics and philosophy, geography, natural history, navigation, commerce, and agriculture in order to give their children a right to study painting, poetry, music, architecture, statuary, tapestry, and porcelain. I doubt that we will ever be able to see studying politics, or sadly, war. And I, for one, will always prefer politics to porcelain. But in doing our work, we must always remember that we seek to create a world in which not just political science, but also mathematics and philosophy, navigation, commerce and agriculture, and painting, poetry, and music all can flourish. If we keep those broader and higher goals in view, and if we strive to pursue them in partnership with each other and with those we serve, then we and they might well find that there's much good that political science can do. Thank you.